Light a campfire and everyone's a storyteller. Join us for some thought-provoking and beyond fireside chats. Today I'm talking to internationally recognized conservationist and photographer Peter Chadwick about the world of marine rangers, the crucial role they play in protecting ecosystems, and what is being done to support these courageous men and women on the front lines of conservation. Good morning, Peter. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning on Leave Our World a Better Place. Morning, Josh. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. It's a great privilege to, to be able to spend some time speaking to you this morning and look forward to it. Yeah, myself, myself uh, too. I um, I have to say that when we were first introduced, I um, I found your list of um, qualifications and achievements quite quite daunting. I mean, law enforcement, reserve management, conservation photography, wildlife and ranger training and development, security guidance, hu- uh, human rights training. I mean, you've done so much. Uh, could could you give us some background on your career? Where did you start and what was it that led you down your path to becoming an award-winning photographer and all the other stuff that you do? Yeah, I think actually, you know, none of it was actually pre-planned at all. What I did certainly know is that uh, conservation was always going to be where I would end up. And I think, um, you know, before I could even crawl, my, my father was carrying me on on his backpack in the wilds of the Zimbabwe bushveld, and we were stalking rhinos so that he could photograph them. And I think those were the the early days that really installed in me the passion uh, that I have, first of all, for for the outdoors and for conservation, and then obviously being side by side with with my father when he was doing the photography that that instilled in me the the interest in in sort of continuing with a camera in hand. And I think I can remember very fondly many hours in the dark room watching these images in the in the trays of uh, chemicals slowly coming to to life and being absolutely awed inspired by them obviously today it's a lot easier with with digital photography and you see the image immediately but yeah my conservation career um i finished schooling as we all have to but uh, thereafter t- i followed the sort of the formal route in getting a diploma in nature conservation and since then i've been incredibly fortunate in in being exposed to a wide range of opportunities that started me off in the kruger national park uh, there i was doing some some work on rare and endangered bird species and oh, had incre- cool. incredible incredible privileges of, of wandering the bush felt in search of, of these rare birds. Um, and then that took me into the Kalahari, doing some work on small carnivores down to the Southern Oceans and Marion Island. And, you know, I also spent a couple of years as, as a field guide at, at Mala Mala Game Reserve. Those were the days when there was very little competition and it was basically Londa Lozi, Sabi Sands and Mala Mala. And the whole industry has changed since then. But yeah, it's certainly after, grown a little bit since then, hasn't it? Yeah, and, and interestingly enough, you know, I was, we, we'll talk about Pinda probably a bit later, but I was at Pinda when it was only 3,000 hectares in size wow. and was, you know, a concept at that stage in terms of it was going to be this next best thing in Zululand. And if you look at, at what it's achieved over its 25 odd years, is is absolutely incredible. But it was after my guiding that I got into, into formal conservation. Uh, I worked for the, the then Natal Parks Board as a reserve manager. And it later and, became and which reserve did you did you manage? So I spent most of my time in the in the Drakensberg. Uh, started off in the southern Drakensberg at at Lateni, and then eventually became sort of regional manager of the central Drakensberg. Uh, which you know the mountains are incredible places. They're wild. They have incredible challenges, but um, very good foundation for for learning a wide range of skills needed for for good conservation. Uh, I then moved to. Uh, to the Western Cape, worked for Cape Nature, both in the Karoo and and in the marine and fanboss environments. And then from there, branched out to join WWF South Africa, 
to manage the marine parks program, uh, which looked at supporting marine protected areas in South Africa and then also in the in the broader region. And then for the last nine or so years, I've been independent where I provide strategic and operational advice to conservation organizations and um, you know countries into the African continent and into the surrounding Indian and, and and Atlantic Ocean. So a very you know very very diverse career, very yeah, sure. um, fortuitous career. I think in many ways, um, certainly had its challenges, but it's it's taken t- taken me to sure the most incredible places that the majority of people don't even realize exist. Yeah, I mean that just in the the the. I was about to say a few places, but in retrospect, you've mentioned many different places that you've had the opportunity to work in. There's so much diversity, both in, um, you know, landscape um, and ecological diversity in the different places you've worked. Um, is it really possible to pick a favorite? Are there any are there any places that you particularly enjoyed spending time in? Yeah, you know, for me, really, my favorite protected area is is the one I'm in at the time. And I think because they are so different and they all have their own unique species and habitats. But I think if you look across all of them, um, standouts for me are, are Zakoma and Savu, or Zakoma in Chad and Savu in, in Kenya, really due to their immense, immenseness and, and their total wildness. You know, it's, you, you bump into lions there, they're still, they're wild. There's no... They're not used to vehicles. They're not used to seeing people on foot. They they stare right through you, which which is an incredible experience. I think Somalia, for its endemic species and arid habitats that no one really knows about, um, mm. Cuisin Island and the Seychelles. You know, they the, the incredible diversity of of tropical seabirds just in in huge numbers is is awe inspiring. I think uh, Prince Edward Islands and Marion Island in the Southern Oceans, just because they are so wild. Um, and then, you know, closer to to home for you guys, certainly Vermezi Island, um, which is part of the Oceans Without Borders suite of, of islands. That hit a big chord for me. And I think, um, you know, it was incredible to get into the Northern Karimbas and see in, in in a relatively small area, such incredible marine diversity that I don't know of anywhere else in the world that has such diversity in such a small area. And I think, you know, also from the the people and and historical side of things, it's it's a place that just needs more recognition and it's it's a place that needs far more support in, in ensuring that it's conserved into the future. So yeah, you know, I think the list go, can go on and on, um, and we we yeah. really just got to make the most of 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 the unique locations that we get to experience. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things that you mentioned um, earlier, which really resonated with me, was this idea of um, exploring a place that still feels wild. Um, and you know, you uh, you were talking about Tacoma and Chad, and you mentioned that you worked at um, Manamala as a guide. And um, having worked myself in the Sabi Sands as a guide, you know, it was obviously in- incredible being able to experience close-up sightings of of wildlife. Um, but sometimes you'd go to like some place where you don't often explore and you'd find perhaps a pride of lions or, or a a leopard that would require you to watch from a distance. And there's just something about that experience, something about an animal that's been virtually, you know, untouched by human presence that is really special to experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there, there are two levels you get, you get animals that, have obviously had some acquaintance with with people and tend to be very shy and and run off but in in some of these big vast areas that I've been fortunate to be in these animals have have probably not even seen many humans and and they're inquisitive and and you know they they really approach you with with wonder curiosity. Or, or curiosity unbelievement in their in their eyes and you know certainly in the in the jungles of of Central Africa, that's that's a sense, and even in in places like Sakoma and and um, you know the Southern Oceans, especially those seabirds, 
they don't worry that you're a human being. They don't see you as a threat. They just see you as, as some strange being within their, their habitat. And I think what it really resonates is that we are very much part of the ecosystem. We're not this superior being in any way. Um, and it's those experiences that really humble you back to to the reality that we have to be part and parcel of, of this world that we live in and, and have to make a you know, a positive difference to ensuring its its long term uh, sustainability and survival for our own well being. Yeah, of course, and um, I mean that sort of segues very nicely into my next question for you. You talk about um, conserving and protecting and ensuring the longevity of these wild spaces, and um, some of the people who are at the forefront of that are our terrestrial and our marine rangers. Um, and so to go from, you know, al although you've had extensive experience in all these different wildlife places, you've done a lot of work, um, with terrestrial and marine rangers. Where does your passion come from? Um, where does your passion for capturing the lives of terrestrial and marine rangers come from and why your dedication to this important task? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question and it's, it's quite a complex question. I think, you know, over over the years, I've I've probably worked with well over a thousand rangers in 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 various forms, and um, you know, the more I travel, the more I get on the ground, I'm, the more I look at the challenges that conservation is facing, um, the more I realise that in many ways we we've been focusing on the wrong things. It's great to highlight that there's wildlife crime and and poaching and, and, you know, habitat destruction, et cetera, et cetera. But if we keep talking about those specific aspects, we're not going to find the solutions. Um, yeah. And in reality, it's the men and women on the ground, the rangers themselves and on the sea, not just on the ground, obviously, but they're the guys at the forefront of, of dealing with all of those challenges. And it's, it's very much those individuals who are going to ensure the long-term success or failure of conservation and, and very much the, the success or failure of, of species preservation. Um, you know, it's, it's no good talking about rhino poaching uh, and saying it's terrible. What is the solution? The solution is ensuring that our ranger teams on the ground um, are able to prevent the poaching from taking place in the first place. And I think, you know, I, I, having worked across the continent, I see these guys with yo, dedication, man, and, and they, yeah, it's, it's, it's very easy to sort of use the word hero glibly, but in reality, if you look at the challenges that they face and the conditions that they work in, there are not many people who would actually gladly take on what they do. Uh, often with, you know, poorly equipped, poorly trained salaries that in some cases are non-existent. I've worked with guys who haven't received a salary for six, seven months, but they wow. they they remain, you know, passionate and and believe Dedicated that the tasks. somewhere along the line that salary will come through. Um, and in the meantime, you know, while they're out there, they're being tossed around on rough seas or being charged by elephants that want to kill them or, you know, engaged in, in, in gunfights with armed poachers. And, you know, when they go home, they, they face risks and, and threats from their families. And I think we've, we've, we've got an obligation to actually recognize these wonderful men and women who work in these incredibly challenging situations and re and we must realize that if we don't support them all our conservation efforts are actually going to be doomed you know the, the globe is talking about this wonderful initiative of, of 30 30 percent of the globe protected by 2030 brilliant you know all the politicians and the scientists are talking about how to do it and we're going to proclaim this and the, this government has committed to achieving it this by this date, et cetera, et cetera. But no one has actually talked beyond proclamation. No one is talking about the practicalities and realities of ensuring that we don't have paper parks and that these areas are actually set aside and well managed and well looked after. And and the immense challenges that they face are mitigated 
And the only way we can do that is, is by ensuring well-qualified, well-equipped, well-supported ranger teams on, on, on those protected areas. So, you know, for me, it's, it's very, it's very important that we raise this issue. You know, I've also seen, um, the harsh realities of the environments that they work in and, 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 you know, the challenges that they face daily does lead to fatalities and, and many, many people that I know, colleagues, friends, um, employees have have given their life for for conservation, and again, the world doesn't care about that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, I am absolutely passionate about it. And and when you get time in the field to spend, you sweat, you you laugh, you cry with these guys. It's we have no option but to but to really start supporting and and raising the importance of the work that they actually do. Yeah, I think I think what you've um, what you've mentioned there is so pertinent with respect to um, you know the goal of protecting thirty percent of the globe, and you can't really do that without people. You you have to have people, whether it's you know buy in from um, buy in from local communities um, and and job creation, and actually having as you've said you know boots on the ground or marine rangers at sea. You you simply can't do it without those people. Um, and another thing that I wanted to, to, to ask you, um, in the context of everything that you've, you've spoken about, um, right now, what is it about conservation photography and photojournalism that makes it your preferred storytelling medium to, to bring to life, um, the lives of these rangers? Yeah. You know, I think given my background and, and, you know, my father's encouragement, the camera's always been on my, by my side out in the field. And, and I quickly realized that, you know, I get incredible opportunities and, and see things which majority of people don't get to see. I, you know, I'm definitely behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, from, from taking images, great images and, and sort of, getting calendar calendar images and postcard images, I, I quickly realized that, you know, that these images aren't really doing much. And I think it was a defining moment for me when I started saying, you know, maybe we could do more with these, these images. Maybe we can create stories that can encourage others and, and showcase the realities, good and bad, of what is really happening at the conservation forefront. So, for me, conservation photography, or for, uh, together with with photojournalism, is is a very powerful medium. It's a very important toolkit in my broader conservation uh, suite of of tools that I use to to try and promote and, and and encourage conservation. And I think you know how do we how do we reach the majority of people across the globe, many of which who never get the incredible opportunities that I do to get on the ground. And the best way of doing that is, is through the, the powerful impact that a, that a good photograph can have. And I think, you know, specifically around the ranger work, what I looked at is, you know, conservation or, or war photographers, should I say, conflict photographers brought home the stories of the reality of world of of war and conflict to the world and and through those mediums you know positive steps were were put in place to support refugees or or even change um you know raise raise the horrors of of landmines for example such that you know global policy is is now out there around the use of of, of landmines so a photograph if used correctly can have a powerful impact way beyond just being a wow moment for, for a viewer. And I think for my mind, it was saying, if we, if we're looking at conservation, we don't really have the same type of impact that those war conflict photographers have, have had. And, and I started trying to utilize similar approaches of really getting up front and raw and show the realities of, of a ranger's life on the ground. You know, I've also raised profiles around marine protected areas and, and threatened species, et cetera. But for me, the, my most passionate uh, and perhaps, perhaps 
impactful conservation journal, photojournalism project is is around the work that I've tried to do around uh, wildlife crime, the issues of wildlife and environmental crime, together with highlighting the roles and and and, and risks and challenges that ranges across the African continent face. And I think it's been, you know, I can't I certainly can't claim. Um, you know, ownership of it entirely, but I think through good pointed stories and, and um, very carefully articulated photojournalism stories, we have managed to to get certain issues out there into the public. And I think, you know, in today's world where we're bombarded with, with social media and with media, we don't have strong or long attention spans. And, and the only way to grab someone's attention is through through a very powerful, strong, unique image. Um, and I think that's where, you know, the photojournalism comes in side by side with with showcasing the challenges for the environment. Yeah, I think um I think you're I think you're so right in the in the sense that a, a few, you know, a few powerful images do have the potential to to really bring as you've said, sort of life on the conservation front lines um, to the world. And, um, you know, importantly, I think um, something that I get from images like the ones that, that you and, and other conservation photographers take is information about what is the life of a ranger. And more importantly, you know, what are these men and women doing on the front lines of conservation and also, how do they differ from guides? Because for a long time, the term guide and ranger was almost kind of interchangeable. And there's often a misconception that guides and rangers fulfill similar roles. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what is the major difference between the two roles? Um, and um, I mean, you've already told me so much about why rangers are important. But um, yeah, what is the major difference between a guide and a ranger? Yeah, definitely there are differences, and I think it's important to note that both play absolutely crucial roles in in conservation. Um, but from a from a, a ranger's perspective, be it marine or terrestrial, their, their work is incredibly diverse, and and it's. It is an often extremely dangerous, challenging environments, um, harsh temperatures, the risk of disease. There's often, you know, species, wild species that are quite happy and intent on some occasions to to trample or kill them, um, such as lions and elephants. And, you know, the marine environment is, is incredibly challenging in its own right. So I think, you know, the environments that they work in is 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 the one thing. But there's a perception these days that a ranger is a guy in camo with a gun hunting a poacher. And, and that is actually only a minor, minor a fraction of the work that they should be doing and are doing. You know, they take, they tackle everything from um, maintenance of fences through roads, through clearing alien vegetation to fighting fires and putting in, uh, carrying out burning of blocks through to monitoring of species and and then specifically around focusing on on priority and endangered species and ensuring that those animals are are safe in the environment uh, sadly you know over the last decade specifically there's been an exponential rise in in wildlife crime and um, you know many of the rangers are having to to don that camouflage uniform and pick up the rifle and, and almost take on a, a semi-military role in, in, in facing what are often well-organized uh, syndicated gangs that are that, that are out to kill either the elephant or rhino or, or other species. And I think on the marine environment, you know, what do they do? They, they're out at sea. They need to be able to swim. Um, ideally, they should be scuba divers as well be able to skip a boat, um, not get seasick, obviously. Um, yeah. But then also, you know, dealing with a lot of community stakeholder issues and then also act as a, um ambassador on the hospitality and tourism side. So a ranger's work is incredibly diverse um, and, and, as I said, incredibly important. A guide, on the other hand, you know, I think 
as I've said, I think they play an absolutely crucial role in the bigger conservation field. They're not so much on the hands-on side of things, um, out in, in the field, in, in the challenging environments all of the time, but they, they're very important in, in looking after guests around the hospitality and tourism side of things. But they're very much ambassadors in transfer, transferring knowledge, um, which they have and have built up over many years to those guests and visitors, so that those visitors and guests in time can hopefully also become ambassadors for conservation. So they're very much at the forefront of that conduit between uh, being out there in, in the wilds and, and getting the, the right messaging to the people who, who don't get to, to see the behind the scenes and, and the challenges that you know, the rangers on the ground are, are perhaps facing and, and the role and, and importance of healthy and functioning ecosystems. And then also the challenges that many of these protected species are facing through aspects such as habitat destruction and, and wildlife crime. So, yes, very different. Um, can one move across from one to the other? Absolutely. But, you know, I think both, both play an incredibly important role in, in achieving the bigger picture. Mm, of course. Um, you... You spoke um, you spoke briefly into the uh, into all of the different requirements and all the different skills that a marine ranger has to have. I mean, you know, being able to skip a boat, you know, scuba dive, um, and also be like you've said, um, community liaisons and ambassadors for conservation. Like that's a very diverse skill set and a very like diverse job. What? Um, what does the sort of life of a marine ranger look like on a day-to-day -day basis? What are some of the roles that um, someone who doesn't know too much about marine rangers would see these people fulfilling on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so a good, again, a good question. And, and, and I think certainly in, in the life of a ranger, no two days are ever the same. Um, and, and depending on, on the specific roles that they have, you know, the day will, will vary. But I think as a founding, you know, what is a founding uh, characteristic of these individuals is they all have to be passionate and, and excited about the, the environment that they're working in. And I think from a marine ranger, the sort of the easy stuff is is doing a beach patrol and perhaps checking on fishing licenses that recreational fishers might need. But then it can elevate very quickly into into dealing with immense challenges in, in some parts of the continent where, you know, they're dealing with armed insurgencies, uh, they're dealing with piracy, they're dealing with illegal commercial, grand scale illegal commercial fisheries through, you know, these vast um, fleets that come into into uh, national waters often overnight and then disappear into the high seas during the day. Um, so yeah, a very dangerous side of work. Um, and then it, on the on the positive and exciting stuff, it can be. You know, donning donning your scuba diving gear and, and falling overboard over an incredible coral reef, and just seeing the the diversity of species that that are lie before you, and then importantly undertaking um, monitoring and and uh, counts of of fish species, uh, checking the health of the coral, whether there's been coral bleaching or not. Uh, and then, you know, on the terrestrial side, it can be measuring uh, and, and tagging turtles that have come ashore to, to breed together with seabirds. And then what else could it be? It could be heading off to the local school to give a presentation on the importance of marine conservation and, and not littering and then engaging with, with high-level politicians at the end of the day. So, you know, a very, very diverse day and, and, and um, a challenging day. But, but I think one of the great things, as I said earlier, is that no two days are ever the same. And, um, you know, that's, that's what makes it exciting. Yeah, um, I, I think that just like what you said, every single day is, is clearly different for, um, for the men and women on the front lines of whether it's marine or terrestrial conservation and that's a 
a lot of stuff that maybe to you know to the untrained eye to the person who you know goes on um goes on a safari or or goes to stay at an island lodge they may not see those day-to-day things happening but it all kind of coalesces to um, allow people to actually experience these wild spaces and so obviously really important roles um uh, so and beyond is very lucky to have at the moment two operating um, lodges or island lodges one um in uh, one on Benguera Island in the Bazaruto Archipelago National Park, and then another one on Member Island in Zanzibar. Um, and thanks to a u- unique collaboration between Africa Foundation and, and beyond, the Oceans Without Borders initiative is very active in all of these spaces, as well as um, further north as well. And you've done a lot of work with Oceans Without Borders. Um, and in that instance, what kind of role did you fulfill and what projects were you involved in? So I've been working with, with and beyond and specifically the guys at Pinda for, for some time around, um, you know, the issues of wildlife crime, terrestrial wildlife crime, and, and supporting the, the, the rangers on the ground there. Um, and I think through that, you know, I was introduced to the marine team, um, Dr. Tessa Hemson, from Oceans Without Borders, and we started engaging specifically around Vermezi Island, which you haven't mentioned, um, at, and that's situated in the northern Karimbas of, of Mozambique. And I think the the initial aspect was for me to get on the ground and, and look at a, a broader conservation assessment and then also look at a uh, area integrity risk assessment. And by the time we actually got onto the ground, unfortunately, you know, the, the insurgency in northern Mozambique was was picking up momentum. So a lot of the focus switched to uh, looking at a security and risk assessment for the personnel on the Mizi Island. And, um, yeah, sadly, you know, shortly after the, that, the, the insurgency did um, skyrocket with, with – terrible results for the coastal towns of northern Mozambique. And unfortunately, the, the team at, um, at Vermezi, uh, an insurgency group, did attack the island. But, you know, fortunately, I think through the, the pre-planning and the foresight of, of Oceans Without Borders to sort of say what, is, what are the security aspects that we need to put in place, the, we were able to develop strategies and protocols that allowed the the team to get away safely um fortunately i think it's it's quietened down a bit now but that that halted sadly halted the, the sort of the larger conservation and tourism initiatives that were were taking place on the island um but uh, you know i mentioned earlier for for my mind it's vermezi is just mind blowing there are few places across the globe that i've seen that can even vaguely parallel to to what Vermezi has to offer on a marine and, and island front um, and then you know through the through the actions at at Vermezi we've obviously maintained uh, contact and and liaise on a fairly regular basis around broader marine conservation issues within the net, uh, within the western indian ocean so linking up with you know the the broader network of of crucial role players uh, is important, and then I think more recently what we're working on is the development of a human rights uh, training and policy for uh, the ranger teams on the ground. Human rights is becoming more and more of a of an important issue as it as it rightly should be, but. You know, a lot of the time people talk about human rights of communities, human rights of of any of the accused in, in criminal cases, et cetera. But nowhere are we talking about the human rights of, of, of the rangers that are on the ground. And I think it's vitally important that we, we need to profile that, you know, these men and women on the ground who are facing these incredible challenges on a daily basis at often to risk of, of life and limb, also have rights. And they also, have, you know, they need to, need to be looked after through, through range of wellbeing programs, but they also need to know how to ensure 
positive relations with with communities. And I think, you know, should they apprehend any suspects who have been involved in illegal activities, that the human rights of those suspects are also carried through in a in a in a positive manner. So, so is that um, not, is that kind of what you when you say human rights, you you're you're talking about what exactly in this context? You know, I think if it if it's a, if it's the rights of the rangers, you know, there's a often you'll you'll see in in criminal cases one talks about the rights of the pro, poacher have been abused by by the rangers. Um, one always forgets that these these people who have carried out their legal activities shouldn't have been there in the first place, and and mm. they are often aggressive. They will often have no problem of trying to injure or even kill kill a ranger and those rangers have rights themselves to 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 protect their own lives and those of their colleagues and i think it's important that we we raise that but at the same time we've you know everyone is is equal in terms of the rights to dignity the rights to life and and it's important that the rangers themselves also understand how to to deal with any suspects um, in in a dignified manner that doesn't doesn't jeopardize the rights of the 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 suspect but also doesn't jeopardize importantly any any court cases that may follow and I think from a ranger well being perspective you know it's important that that the rangers have adequate housing, they have adequate training, they have adequate equipment. Um, in many cases, if if rangers have been involved in traumatic uh, incidents, of which every ranger in his working career is likely, unfortunately, to have some traumatic uh, experience, be it through, you know, fatalities of, of fellows or recoveries of, of drowned, drownings out at sea, or seeing attacks by by um, animals that have have, have trampled or, or killed a community member, you know those are all all traumatic experiences, and we need to support rangers through uh, psychological um, support, and also you know make sure that that their families are also looked after, and their families have the support that they they need while their their loved ones are away, often for long periods of time. Well, wow. I mean, that just really puts into perspective, um, you know, just a small suite of challenges that that these men and women are facing on a on a daily basis and on a on a long term basis. Um, and have you have you also done a lot of work with the Game Rangers Association um, of Africa? Because a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, like the, um, you know, like a uh, um, mental mental support and um, protection and uh, you know making sure they have um, up to date and functioning um, good quality gear and all that sort of stuff sounds like a lot of the work that that they are doing as well so have you been involved with a lot of their work too yes very much so, so work very closely with with the game rangers association of africa um and you know, I think where they've been great is they've really put rangers in Africa on on the map in not only on the, on the continent but also at an international level. And it's very important, as we've been discussing, you know, to profile the, the challenges and and needs of these rangers. And I think they've really been successful in in bringing the rangers across the continent. Um, on a more solid platform, but also, you know, great in terms of the networking opportunities that have been provided. And it's wonderful to sort of be in touch with guys working from South Africa all the way to, you know, the Ivory Coast through to the Horn of Africa, through to Mozambique, et cetera. So very, very important role that they play. And I think, you know, one of the approaches that we use, um, when we start working in any protected area is we undertake a what we call parks assessment assessment it's a protected area ranger capability and support assessment which really looks at all of the aspects required for um, rangers to be able to effectively do their work and and within that there is um, an assessment of the skills and the equipment that the rangers need and have 
and then also looking at their well-being aspects as well as you know institutional support and judicial and uh, support and also how they work with the surrounding stakeholders and i think from that that assessment what we then do is develop um tailor-made packages for the reserves that we're working with in terms of of the support that those those sites need and and that's where a lot of the the range of mentoring and and training aspects come in and then also linking those protected areas with um you know with with the right people to support them in in other areas such as the psychological support and also the legal support um should it be needed sure wow um you know, you've you've spoken so well into the different threats and challenges that that you know these ranges face and you've spoken about um you know threats of piracy or organized crime at sea um you know it, it, dealing with potential sort of illegal fishing activities the fact that they're often under resourced um and you even mentioned something um regarding you know dealing with family members and and members of the community um is it is it difficult for some of these men and women to be on the conservation front lines when they're coming from communities which you know may have other ideas on how the land and ocean should best be used absolutely um yeah uh, you know i think it's 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 not only the working environment that is challenging to to many of these these men and women often you know they come from from communities who as you've rightly said have have a belief that that landscape or seascape should be open for for utilization um and and it's 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 extremely hard to to justify existence of these protected areas when there's such high levels of of poverty in the surrounding areas and i think you know when a ranger has to to challenge an illegal activity and i think we have different levels of it, of illegal activity from a sort of a subsistence poacher who's absolutely desperate for for food for him or herself and and their families you know you can't you can't apply the same um approach that you would to an organized criminal who is armed with an automatic weapon and intent on on making large sums of money from from their activities so they you know first of all they've got to be able to the rangers have have got to be able to uh, uh, differentiate between the levels of threat that that they are facing and and is being caused by by the legal activities and i think in apprehending poachers or or suspects at any time that creates animosity with first of all the suspect themselves obviously but but then with the suspect's family and and greater community and and where a ranger has had to arrest them, a community member who is not in support of the protected area that obviously antagonizes the relationships that are at a much higher level and then you know in some cases and quite regularly actually many of the rangers end up having to arrest family members um wow. as well so when these these men and women you know they go home they um they often ridiculed and and challenged by the communities that they and even threatened by the communities that they're actually living in so you know again one of the big differentiations people talk about um you know post traumatic stress disorder in in military veterans but what happens with a with with a military is that a unit is deployed into a conflict area for a set period of time be that 6 months a year even but then they are withdrawn totally from that that conflict area and actually have breaks in between um that deployment period they they then remove totally for for long periods of time from that conflict uh, zone a ranger on the other hand is is living at 24/7 365 days a year either on the protected area or even when they're on their time off going home because there's there's always this pressure from you know community members from from neighbors even politicians who don't believe in the in the conservation cause so it's very 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 difficult for 
for these men and women to actually be able to switch off from from the challenges that they are facing. Wow! Yeah, that just puts into perspective the the tough line that they have to to you know walk on a daily, monthly, and and yearly basis. Um. No, we've we've been speaking today so much about the world of both you know terrestrial and importantly marine rangers, and you know if I think if I think back to sort of how um, guiding rangers um, and the difference between the two has kind of morphed over the years, I, I feel like terrestrial rangers were. Um, at least they were a slightly more known entity compared to like marine rangers. Why, why do you think that the world of marine rangers has been relatively unknown until now? And what can we do to change that? Mm, good question again. Um, you know, I think as, as, as you've said, is, is the world at, at large has really spoken about earth and there's, you know, therein lies the first false perception. This planet that we're living on is called from its terrestrial perspective and not from its oceanic perspective. And actually, we should not be called Earth. We should be called ocean, um, given the vast amounts of, of, of oceanic space that we have in comparison to the terrestrial side of things. But I think, you know, very much everything has been focused about about land. It's always about the wolves, or it's always about the vast plains of Africa teeming with wonderful wildlife, or the tigers in India, or you know the kangaroos in Australia. We don't talk about the oceans, and I think one of the problems with the, with the oceans is that yes, we know they're there, but we don't actually understand them because all that we see in the majority of, of, of cases of humanity is just this blue wild space that is, is moving constantly with waves and, 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 and currents, but we don't get to know really what is underneath its waters. And it's, you know, the only time we do that is, is if we get involved in scuba diving or, or, or we watch the sort of the, the national geographics or the David Attenborough programs of the world. And I think, if people don't understand what the ocean is and what it comprises of, they can't support it and can't talk about it and can't be passionate about it. Um, and because of that, you know, anyone working on the marine environment is also not going to be, be recognized because people don't understand really what they do. Um, and I think what we can do to change is, is, is certainly, you know, through programs like, we we undertaking right now with this pod, podcast and and the use of social media and and broader media is really start profiling the roles and importance that marine rangers play in in not only the protection of that immediate area that they're working on but the long term sustainability of of the planet as a whole and i think you know we need to recognize not a lot of people sort of say yeah rangers is just there for conservation um, yeah, that's true, but it's not only about the protected area. It's actually about you know ecological integrity of the planet, ensuring functioning ecosystems remain in place, um, and it's also about food security. And particularly, the, the the marine rangers on the on the ground play an incredibly important role in securing um, marine resource populations within the the protected areas that, in turn, are able to breed in, in suitable numbers and, and move beyond the protected area boundaries through spillover, and, and those become the food sources for, for you know, many um, small-scale fishing communities as well as, as the larger globe as a whole. And, and, and we need to build this um, Awareness campaign, I suppose, would be the right right wording. Is is really profile the entire aspects of of why marine conservation is important, the role that it plays in the sustainability of the planet, and and therefore through that profile the importance of the roles and responsibilities of marine rangers, and and look at the positive and negative challenges that these these individuals face. 
Yeah, I think um, something that you you mentioned, which kind of resonated with me, is this this whole thing of for so long the perspective of um, our perspective of Earth has been terrestrial, and even you know up until you know recently, I don't think people really thought about the the finite nature of marine resources, and so you know before there were before there were large marine reserves, there were large terrestrial reserves and, and um, eventually like, you know, ranges to protect those. And so the marine, the protection in the marine realm is relatively recent. And so I feel like for that reason too, marine ranges have not, their story has not really been brought to the forefront until now. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's really, I mean, in the last two decades or so that there's really been a massive drive to ensure um, protection of, 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 of seascapes both. And I think, you know, in the past, it's been very much the, the coastline that has had formal marine protection. And, and what we forget is the coastline is a, a minute percentage of, of the vastness of the ocean. And, and I think, you know, one of the great things we spoke about it at the, the 30 by 30 initiative, 30% of the ocean by 2030, is it's a wonderful initiative because we have to set aside uh, areas of the high seas from the surface right to its deepest depths under protection to ensure uh, long-term survival of the planet and the health of the planet, but also the su- sustainability of, of the ecosystem and, and the associated benefits that they bring. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's a, it's a wonderful initiative, but we have to then ensure that those proclaimed areas are not paper parks and only on a, on a, you know, on a government notice or something, but that, that they actually are being managed effectively and, and have the staff and, and logistical support that they need. And, and we need to, you know, Marine rangers need to have a a specific skill set, a specific passion, and I think a lot of that has been lacking, and I think many of the conservation agencies, and even in South Africa, you know, as as marine protection has expanded over the last two decades, they'll transfer a a terrestrial conservationist to now manage a marine conservation area. And while the broader management uh, practices are similar, there's a very specific and and unique knowledge set that is needed to to effectively manage those those marine areas. So one of the you know one of the big projects that I work on is is with WAMSA, which is the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association, uh, and and we basically work from you know the Horn of Africa all the way down through to and and including Namibia, and that's really focused on. Um, expanding and encouraging marine science at the first level. But within that, we have a program of, of capacitation and certification, professional certification of marine protected area officials uh, so that we can really start building the skill sets required to effectively manage these, these important sites and very diverse sites. And then also to through professional accreditation, highlight the importance of recognition that marine conservation is a professional field. It's a difficult field. It, it creates, it, it requires a lot of time and, and, and understanding to be, become at a point where one is effective, effective in your management. And I think, you know, the principles that we, we are applying in the Western Indian Ocean level we're now trying to push across to the rest of the Atlantic and, and into, you know, around the African continent. So these programs are certainly starting to be developed, but there's a lot more that can always be done. Yeah. Wow. That's, um, and I, I think what, what really resonates with me from, um, from what you've just said there is that it's no longer, it's no longer a case of just, you know, sticking a uniform on, on someone and, and putting a rifle in their hands. It's now, it's now also about actually getting all of the right accreditation, certification, upskilling, and ensuring that, um, the people who are tasked with 
with looking after our marine resources are given all of the skills that they need, the skills, the training, and all the tools to do the job correctly. And I think that's that's really important now and going forward. Absolutely, yeah. No, 100%. Agree with you 100%, Dan. Oh. Thanks, thanks very much, Peter. All of your all of your insights into the world of of marine rangers, terrestrial rangers, conservation. Um, it's been so interesting to to chat to you. And um, yeah, thanks again for for joining us on the podcast. Thank you very much once again. And um, yeah, you know, I think as I said, these these podcasts are critically important and and. Our important function of getting the the needed message out there. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, you're more than welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thank you for listening to Leave Our World a Better Place. Don't forget to subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode. If you'd like to find out more about and beyond, please log on to our website at andbeyond.com. <laughs>